Welcome. Welcome to the workshop for Otilia Cromwell Day on Meridians, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, and Feminist Women of Color Transnational Knowledge Production. Um, my name is Janetta Candelario, and I am the editor of Meridians and a Smith alum, class of 1990. Which is why, before I start our slideshow and formal presentation, I'm going to take five minutes to share with you part of the history that was not included in this year's version of the Cromwell Day video. Um, it's history that I and my classmates were directly a part of. In fact, it was one of our demands that established Otelia Cromwell Day. And because they were left out, I feel compelled to call their names and to tell you a little bit of that story, which makes me sad wasn't included in this year's video. Um, nor is one of the key sites of that history marked on the map, uh, and that is Chapin House, right? So my left, your right, down the lane here. Um, so in the late 1980s, which is when I arrived at Smith in 1984, from 84 to when I eventually graduated after leaving Smith three times because of the nature of racist um, violence, both over and uh, covert at the college and in town and in the five colleges made this a really inhospitable place to be what we now call women of color or at the time we called ourselves minority students, even for someone who looked like me. Right, but had an accent and had a name that didn't align with the accents and the names of most of my classmates and had a class background that most certainly did not align as the daughter of an AFDC dependent single mother exile from the Dominican Republic. Um, during that period from 1984 to 1990, students like me were subjected to things like overtly racist spray painting graffiti on, for example, the building of Lily Hall, which is where the Mwangi Center was originally cited as a result of the activism of the class of 1974 that since then unparalleled class of uh, black students at Smith uh, who organized to establish the Mwangi Center. The steps of that building we found one morning were spray painted with the words N's, S's, and C's, I won't say the words, go home, literally at our doorstep. My classmates and housemates in the house I lived in, Parsons, found black dolls with nooses around their necks, hanging from their doorknobs. Other classmates who had bested their white housemates out of a room that they wanted during room draw found spray painting on their windows in Cutter and Ziskin that said S, sand N, go home. Notes were routinely delivered to us in our mailboxes, in our homes, because we didn't have centralized mailboxes the way you do right now. And one morning, when I had spent the night with my best friend, Wambui Mwangi, who was the daughter of Florence and Gendo Mwangi, for whom the Mwangi Center was named, and who was the first African student to attend and graduate from Smith, class of 1961. And she was the founder of SACSA, the Smith African Students Alliance, which became the Smith African and Caribbean Students Alliance by the time we graduated. When Bui and I woke up from a long night of studying together in her room at Chapin House, second floor, the front of the building, to banging by Sipokazi, who was a Chosa South African student, one of five black women at Chapin House, who that morning found poems that had been written specifically tailored to each of their personal biographies, filled with racist slurs and imagery and threatening them harm if they didn't shut their collective mouths because we had been agitating for racial justice at Smith. And so we got up and looked at one buoy's door and she had a note as did Jen Jackson and the two other women. And that triggered yet the latest of our protests and organizing. A march to the president's office, a march to her house, et cetera. And what eventually became more than two dozen clearly articulated demands that included the establishment of a day like Otelia Cromwell Day 
and the development of the Smith Design for Institutional Diversity. The work began in August of 1988, and it was done by the time we graduated in 1990. The we that I'm referencing was a group of students that called themselves, we called ourselves the Concerned Students of All Colors. Because from the beginning, we envisioned ourselves as a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-class, what we now call intersectional coalition that understood that racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, imperialism, settler colonialism are political and ideological problems that everyone has a stake in undoing and that everyone has a historical connection to and not always on the side we imagine as it turns out. And that we concerned students of all colors we're determined to push Smith forward and make it live up to the promise of its history. The promise that women, that people identified as women at the time, would transform society for the better. And that knowledge production and creativity would be at the heart of that. That we would bring our incredible talents to bear, beginning right here at home. When I graduated in 1990, along with my classmates, and I wanna take a moment especially to honor Wambui Mwangi, Jennifer Fleming, Natasha Joffrey, Asha Kalaru, and Kathy Ahn, who were the core co-conspirators. We never thought we'd come back to Smith. I certainly never thought I'd come back to Smith. So I was surprised when in 1998, I did return as a Mendenhall Fellow appointed in sociology and Latin American and Latino studies, and then subsequently became the first Latino studies hire at the college. And I've been here ever since, since 1999. I raised my children here. I buried my mother here. And I've done all that because I believe in this place. And I believe in you. And I believe that events like this are transformative as are your classes and your readings and the work that you do both on and off campus. So um, if you give me a moment to collect myself, I will continue with the formal program. Okay. So the plan for the workshop is to welcome you, to introduce the team that is behind and alongside Meridians, to offer you an overview of Meridians, to then introduce you to my co-host, Tracy Ann Wint, who's joining us from Jamaica. To then engage in a collective audience reading of the poem by Barbara Jane Reyes, which is this year's Elizabeth Alexander Creative Writing Award winner. To do a debriefing after the reading, to engage in a writing exercise collectively where we will create together. To read what we accomplish and then to wrap our time together. So as you may know, Meridians was founded here at Smith by four faculty members. Elizabeth Alexander, who was the founder of what is now the Boutel Day Poetry Center and the president of the Mellon Foundation and the author of Praise Song for a New Day when she was National Poet Laureate for the Obama inauguration. Anne Arnett Ferguson who was a faculty member in what was at the time Afro-American studies and a sociologist. Nancy Saporta Sternbach, who was my professor at Smith and one of the founders of the Latin American and Latino Studies program, and one of the first to document in the United States the history of feminisms in Latin America and the Caribbean, a torch which I now proudly carry. And Susan Van Dyne, who established the Women's Studies program, now the study of women and gender here at Smith, and led the way for the establishment of similar programs throughout the United States. These four faculty members came together because they were co-colleagues uh, in women's studies 
and were um, pleased that we had already by this time journals like Signs and Feminist Frontiers and so forth, but displeased that all of those journals centered white feminism and engaged in a add women of color and stir approach to understanding the feminist and women's history of the majority of the world's women. And with that in mind, they approached Ruth Simmons, who was the first black president of Smith College and proposed to her that Smith be the home for a brand new feminist studies journal that would center women of color feminist knowledge production in all its forms from research-based scholarship, the cornerstone of academic work and theorizing, but also creative writing, poetry, short story, plays, visual art, photo essays, et cetera. And Ruth Simmons, true to her leadership, found the funding five years from the Ford Foundation and thus began the project that is now celebrating it is 22nd year. And which I am pleased to announce is part of an endowment campaign having received a lead gift of $1 million just this past March. So go ahead and clap because that is quite an accomplishment. So if you know somebody who wants to be an angel donor, I got a project for them. Ruth's quote, which appeared in volume one, number one, which I'm proud to say, by the way, is where I also appeared. My very first peer reviewed published essay came out in Meridians, volume one, number one, it was a chapter from the dissertation I was working on when I joined the faculty. It's called Hair Racing, Dominican Beauty Shops and Cultural Identity Production. And it is still being cited and published today, thanks to the kind of support I got as a young author in Meridians. My relationship to Meridians continued obviously, uh, for the next 22 years. Ruth's quote from that introductory essay, women of color have many histories and these histories can be brought into full and useful relief by providing opportunities for these women to speak for themselves is on everything that we give away and brand because it is central to our mission today still. Just very quickly, because I've taken more time than I should have, we've had three prior editors. Our first editor was Kumkum Bhavnani, who's a sociologist also at UC Santa Barbara. Miriam Shansi, who's a Scripps professor, uh, I'm sorry, college professor of humanities at Scripps College. And Paula J. Giddings, who you may know is one of the founders of Black Women's Studies in the United States and an illustrious and award-winning author who was editor for 12 years until 2017 when she handed the baton to me and I have been privileged to be in this seat since then. This is my fifth year as editor. If you want to know more about my scholarship, thanks to my stride fellow Kyla, I now have a website that includes every one of the Meridian's intros, but also some of my other published work and I invite you to go take a look there. We also have an amazing uh, editorial advisory board comprised of both Smith College and Duke University faculty, because we are published by one of the most highly regarded presses in the academy, Duke University Press. Um, I won't read all their names, but I invite you again to go to our website and look up these folks and take classes with them if, uh, if they're here at Smith with you, um, because they really are leading luminaries nationally and internationally in their respective fields. We also have an amazing creative writing advisory board, which is comprised largely of Smith faculty, but also a faculty member from Duke, Zitsi Jaji, and a former editorial assistant at Meridians, Leslie Maria Aguilar, who is now the managing editor for studies in English literature and an award-winning Chicana Tejana poet. And uh, last but not least, we are um, lucky to have as part of our staff five amazing student interns who are joining us today, Nelida Ayala, Roy Yu Zhang, Amina Gasa, Kyla Frazier, and Rebecca Connor. And they're all here with us today and are gonna be um, helping us with this project. And also, though she's not in the slideshow, I'm really happy to introduce you to Ali Einbinder, who some of you may have heard, is a Smith alum, study of women and gender and sociology, and the founder of the punk band Potty Mouth. Fans welcome after the show. <laughs> um, we have social media. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, if you don't already, follow us. There are postings every single day. Um, and I've also put out a sign-up sheet for you to get our newsletter. We also have a bookshop page, a YouTube channel, where, for example, our 20th anniversary event, which featured folks like um, Angela Davis, 
and Cassandra Shaler in conversation with me. Lisa Majaj, I mean, it's a who's who, right, of Meridian's authors, and that's available for you on YouTube. Our focus today is going to be on the poem that is included in our most recent issue, which is literally hot off the presses. It was just released last Wednesday. Um, that's 21.1. It is focused on feminist mornings, about which my co-presenter will say a little more. Um, our next issue is on BIPOC Europe. The issue after that is on a mosaic issue that covers a lot of ground, geographically and otherwise. Um, and we are working on finalizing two special issues on global indigenous feminisms that, of course, include the Western Hemisphere, but I think really importantly range far from the Western Hemisphere to Asia, to Africa, to the Middle East, and India. Um, the focus of our work today is going to be the winner of this year's Elizabeth Alexander Creative Writing Award, which was founded in 2019 to, to honor Dr. Alexander, who was the founder of our Boutel, now called Boutel Day Poetry Center. And the winner is award-winning poet. It turns out um, she was selected by a double blind jury, um, but it turns out she's a highly accomplished and established poet, Barbara Jane Reyes, whose uh, poem, Daughter Song Diaspor, we will be reading together today. And I'll note for all of you budding writers, we are currently accepting submissions for this year's Elizabeth Alexander Creative Writing Award. This is an open submission process. Everyone is welcome to submit. We ask that you focus on the theme related to our mission, feminism, race, transnationalism. But other than that, sign on. It's now my pleasure to introduce my co host as I said, all the way from Jamaica, Tracy Ann Wint, who is an assistant professor in Africana Studies. She earned a doctorate in African and African Diaspora Studies in 2019 from the University of Texas at Austin and holds a micromaster in instructional design and technology from the University of Maryland Global Campus. And you will see that masters and that mastership of pedagogy at work here today. A Black feminist and critical race studies scholar, Professor Wint is currently writing a book titled Reviving Paradise, Tourism and Making the Jamaican Nation that explores the way a neocolonial tourism industry extends the race and gendered hierarchies of the plantation in the modern Anglophone Caribbean. She is the author of peer-reviewed articles on the Tambourine Army, a radical Jamaican women's rights organization, and on mothering in the time of Black Lives Matter and social media. She is also a published poet and experienced media producer. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wint. Um, and just very quickly, because we're at registration time, right? Uh, Professor Wint is teaching two classes in the spring that I thought you might want to know about Africana Anthropology 202, Anthropology in the African Diaspora, and Africana 202, Art, Activism, and Media, the Black Radical Imagination. So just in case you want to follow up and take a class with Professor Wint. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Wint, who will lead us from here. All right, thank you so much. Um, it is really a joy to be here with you all today. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our collective writing exercise. But before we get into that, um, the process of writing is really so connected to the act of reading and the, the, the way that we move through the work as, um, as we read it. And Barbara Drain Reyes's poem is, um, it's beautiful, it's moving. Um, and I think as we read it together, you will find that there are ways that it speaks to you as well. I'm gonna ask, well, well we can leave this up here. Um, this is what we will use for collective writing exercise, but we, before we attend to this, um, I know you all have the poem with you um, on, on some printouts that you can read. And so maybe we'll put away the, the QR code for right now. Don't pay too much attention to the QR code just yet, as we're going to get into the process of reading it. Barbara Jane Reyes begins her poem saying to us, this is my story, the one I made up about myself and told no one. Um, and for me, that particular line is so telling because there, there's so much about the ways that we move across borders, we move across time, 
the ways that we try to engage ourselves in community, the, wor the work that we do to fit in, um, that requires us to build a story that sometimes we don't feel comfortable sharing, or a story that we have to, uh, in, in some ways, almost create a different story for different settings. So today, as we go through our writing and our reading, I'm going to ask you to take some time to explore within yourself, thinking about what is your story? What, what is the story that you've made up about yourself? Where is this story coming from? Is it a story as, um, as the point that we're engaging today is talking about a story that is connected to your mother, whether that is um, in a really kind of literal self sense, the person, people who raised you, or to a kind of broader sense, your mother in terms of land, in terms of community, in terms of a homeland of some sort. And where is it from? What language do you tell it in? Um, is it the same language that you truly understand, the same language that feels like home to you? And what is the language that you are understood in? Is it the one that you speak? So many of us, especially um, for people of color, the languages that we speak are the very ones that were used to oppress us. And so there is a lot of tension that exists there, a lot of sorrow. Um, but also within that sorrow, there's a sense of beauty because of the way that it connects us. So today we will honor Reyes's work and our own ideas and experiences um, of home and loss and mourning, but also of discomfort and thinking through the places that we have been, the places that we are, the ways that we try to fit in. We will acknowledge that as we move across borders, as we move across time, that there are different interpretations and so much of that has to do with the ways that our tongues move and feel heavy and be tongue tied as you will also express in reading Barbara Drain Reyes's poem and uh, engaging in the practice of reading aloud something that you have not written that may not be fully in a language that you speak or understand, or even if it is in the language that you speak or understand, the fact of not having spent a lot of intimate time with it might also put us in, in a little bit of space of unsettling. Um, and what we're doing in this is building a sense of community and acknowledging, I'm giving you all of this so you don't go into the reading nervous, um, but acknowledging that we speak in different ways based on where we are and how we are trying to fit in or not. And that in that there is always going to be some amount of error. But what is important also is the effort that we make to do it and the space that we leave ourselves for, um, for correction and community building. So with that said, I hope everyone has a copy of the poem with them. We're going to begin um, a reading of Daughter Song Diaspora. We will go through, you'll see that the poem is written um, in somewhat of a loose couplet form. Um, and so you will read the two lines that are closest to each other when it is your turn to read. We will read it as a collective, um, one at a time. So uh, we will begin and you just move to the person next to you, um, depending on how many of us are actually in the room or online. Um, it may mean that you are reading twice. So it also is asking you to engage in an exercise of paying attention to the reading of others so that you have a sense of where we are in the exercise um, and when it is time for you to engage in reading again. So Tracy, may I just say, I'm gonna pass, uh, Professor Wint is gonna start, then I'll go, then Ali, then the interns will go to give you all a chance to get the rhythm of the thing. And we're gonna pass around the microphone. Okay, so that we can all hear each other. And again, just do your best. Okay. Okay. And um, you say, Ready? So, Candelario, are you going to go ahead yep. and do the, the first line? Yes. Right. Barbara Jane Reyes, Daughter Song Diaspore. This is my story, the one I made up about myself and told to no one the one I scribbled into my notebook that nobody knew about. They say my mother fastened her wings and she flew across the ocean back to her own mother's nest where I was pulled from her body drooling. Salted, already browned, eyes open, 
already speaking, already asking. And they say my mother refastened her wings and then she flew away. This is my my book book of holy holy things. The first time my mother flew away, I was still learning my first language, my Psalms of Palam, which is to say, my mother tongue is absent, is classifying beautiful birds in flight, is fibrous diaspora that the wind lifts into myth. Next, it was my turn to fly, to find her in the cold gray of San Francisco Bay, uprooted tropical seed, all milk. Teeth, talismans, questions in my many-tongued mouth, I learned to bind my poems in abaca, I learned to speak. In subtracted tongues, tongue-tied always, too accented or too unaccented, winged syllables spat and grounded. Consonants hardened as silk seeds scattered, drought depraved and dumb, I sang in secret in the dirt, I listened. Girl child, orb weaving eggshell, root and bark into time, composed spells from pine cones, ladybugs, and lullaby. Agaya Manak, agony in the garden is the first sor- sorrowful mystery. Ave Maria Nonco Cati Garcia, ni apo Dios ti ada kenka. Ave Maria in ab- abundance and all this novena to no avail. This beautiful blood warm Babylon, I bye bye, um, I bagio, bye bye become brittle vessel, bye bye brimming to burst. Gozi Galua, once in my mother's cocoon, Casino Sarcoma has instead recast her a clubbing chrysalis. She closed her eyes. Dios ti agnica, deities of air, of wind, of sky, when you decide to take her from us, dear Diwa, please brush her hair and sing her a lullaby. Her even song and ever blipping cadence, electronic vespers early into dawn. Forget. Fragrant green girlhood of my mother, where I wanted just one moment of grace with her, but now grief is my gold and my ghost and my gravity. Filled with hummingbirds, Halika in the chest, homing there, the heart monitor. I cannot unhear it thrumming in my own hollowed out heartwood. Ita ken inton oras ti apapatiami. In an ideal world, this poem, all my poems, I would intone in my mother's mother tongue. Jusco as in Dios copo, just how much one woman body endures. Kasinakami, kalapati, cooing like us. Morning, flame-breasted, black naped, and hearts bleeding. Luck Bay, and the song that goes, Lamipadka, King of Gang, Maya, I'm thinking of Laya, and Leo too. My mother used to say, when we were molded from mud now, only memes is of mythology and miracle. Nagan, hers means living one, light, mother of life, little bird. What had she prophesized when she aimed me? Sing oceanic, ask if grief tips us to overpour. Ask if this is what one's lungs become when overcome. Panona pag. Pumanawa Kana. The quick tongued queen mother birthed quick tongued brown daughters. Kehor. Remember our river, remember our robins, eggs, shells cool blue, robed in rosy sunset, nesting and resting in my mother's jasmines. 
Ken Sarat met Singh Sampagita in Seashell. She has slipped out of the kit into starlight spirit. She has soared into the swallowtail sky. Tamat Dangampa in Manga Pakapa at Pagatapaf's Transfiguration Henge. Mangit, how to translate any of it. Of this untied, ambiguous, unknowing, untranslatable, all I can say is this. Siya ang ugat n aking lahat. And that is all there is to that. What color, what texture, what timber did hers have? Wa na, the keep a pay and why and why. What all I should have asked her, what all I should have said, whether she would have answered. Equus, films held up to light box showing images of trees rooting, branching, flowering, bearing fruit, seeding and rooting again and again. You capped and also Yari. How to, how to navigate the passage of this mother body. Sarzuela, ay apo Dios. We always loved a good song and dance number. We kind of lived in one once, didn't we? The last time my mother flew away, she must have returned to her mother. I want all the maps, almanacs. Of wind and ocean currents, I want a silver compass and laid diaspora uh, marking true north leather prayer books. My mother's mother tongue, olive wood rosaries, copper dowsing rods, bronze egg shaped agonot. What languages must I relearn? What sacred songs? What incantations shall I pull from deep memory? Into the light, I pray, please help me find my mother. I hold to my heart my silvered amulets, virgin martyr. Headstrong Tokaya, lightning, rose-clad wild daughter, little one of mighty noise, how may I regain my faith? Cleansed by the waters of Fatima, she shines starlight. Let me find my mother in a state of pure, unfettered joy. Thank you all so much for engaging that. Let me find my mother in a state of pure, unfettered joy. Before we get into our own um, writing exercise, I don't know if anyone would like to share a little bit of what the process of reading that and listening to it being read felt like to you. Were there bits of it that um, resonated with you or that you chose not to say? Did you feel yourself stumbling? What did that feel like, especially in a room of your peers and of people that you may not know? Anyone? There are room mics, but if anyone wants to talk, I'm gonna hand you the handheld mic because it's, it will be easier for Tracy Ann to hear. Um, personally, it was nerve wracking. Like, what if I mispronounced something or like stumbled over my words and just like anticipating the mic coming towards me. And like, I honestly read ahead to see which line and like practiced it. So I didn't really pay attention to what was actually happening, which is bad, but the truth. So <laughs> thank you for being honest. There's something so powerful in that. And I think, um, the, the poem tells us much more than we can really extract fully today, but there is there's something about the ways that speaking, um, speaking a language that is not what is spoken commonly in community, speaking a language that um, holds something really dear to you in a room where others are not speaking it, trying to navigate this kind of sense of what if I do something wrong or say something um, that is not entirely correct is also I think a part of 
the condition of um of moving across borders it's a part of the condition of moving across water it's a part of the condition of diaspora um and barbara drain Reyes speaks about that kind of discomfort and sorrow so beautifully as she connects that same kind of uh, maybe unsettling feeling with the loss of um with with her mourning with her sorrow for her mother um Anyone else want to share? We think we can maybe have one more person before we get into our exercise. Either the experience of reading or if there's something in the poem that has really spoken to you. I thought it was pretty awesome. It really made me think really, really hard and feel a lot. Um, I was just so intrigued thinking like, oh man, what if I was in a place where I did not speak the language in any way and how would I navigate? I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, who's up next? <laughs> um, hi, um, it also made me think of my mom because she doesn't speak English. So I felt the fear that probably she feels on a daily basis of not being able to understand a language and having to be called upon to speak in English. And I remember feeling very frustrated with her <laughs> where mm -hmm. I always had to be the translator, but I was reminded of how strong she is and always having to put up with that. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and there is a way also, Barbara Drain Reyes says, you know, this is my book of holy things. We think about the ways that there's something, there's something so sacred about that experience and about that connection that you're talking about also with your own mother. Um, so let's get into our exercise. As I said, when we started, we're also going to engage in a process of collective writing. And if you, um, Use this QR code here on your phone, or if you type that URL into uh, your browser, it should take you to Padlet. And I will also share my screen shortly so that you can have a sense of what this will look like. That is where we will write together um, when we pull all of the pieces of our collective poem together. But before you're typing into Padlet, you're gonna go a little old fashioned just on regular paper or you know if you're typing separately together on your phones or something um in groups of three and those who are in the room will help you to organize yourselves i like you to write two lines so the poem that we have here from barbara jane Reyes is written in somewhat of a couplet form it's like an op it's an open um couplet so you can see that they the lines um, have almost equal length in terms of how long they actually are. Hi. Um, <laughs> hi. So, you know, we're talking about mothering. I am a mother myself. <laughs> Everyone move that way. Okay. <laughs> That's <Sarah>. perfect, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to everyone here. Okay, so as you get together in your groups, um, everyone come together, talk a bit about what they, what your own experiences of home are. What, what are the things um, that maybe you have this same kind of beautiful experience of sorrow? This is beauty or beauty and sorrow um, together, as as Reyes talks about. She says, you know, her mother tongue is absent, is classifying beautiful birds in flight. And so she's giving us these different um, kinds of experiences and words to talk about mourning. I'm asking you to tap into your own sense of home and community um, and speak about that for, you can say maybe you'll speak together for about four minutes and within that then spend another six minutes or so coming up with the two lines that you will write as a collective. And then once you have your two lines, you will type those into Padlet, which will auto-generate for us a beautiful 
line and then we can decide whether we want to reorder things or read it as is. So I'm going to repeat what Professor Wint said um, because she's <laughs> she's working in difficult conditions right now with our lovely future Smithy. Um, so again, we're going to ask that you uh, get together with it might be the row might be the easiest way instead of three. We had thought three, but if you get together with your row and come up with two to three sentences together, right? So first start by discussing the poem and, and what, what resonated for you. Do you think you could do three little groups of three? Would that work? Yeah, all right. So little groups of two to three, let's say that, because we have seats there for five. For about four minutes, just talk about the poem, what came up for you. And then for about five minutes, write two lines. We gave you scratch paper for that. Um, and then you're going to actually upload your two lines into the Padlet. And don't worry about anything. Just go with your gut, OK? So four minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. And introduce yourselves, obviously, to each other if you don't know each other. Two more minutes. When you are ready to write in Padlet, if you open up on your phone, you'll see it has a little plus sign in a circle. And that's where you click for um, a screen to come up for you to, to write in. And you can just type your lines where it says, write something beautiful. Um, if you are on a laptop, then that little um, addition sign will be on the right-hand side of your screen. So go ahead and finish your typing. We, um, you know, we'll just take another 30 seconds to do that. We wanna make sure you get the chance to do that. Um, and thank you for engaging in the exercise. Um, we're gonna share what we wrote together with the Cromwell Day Committee. Maybe they'll publish it. We'll definitely publish it on our Meridian's website with all of your names as co-authors, right? Okay. All right, when you're all done, let me know with just a hand up so I know that everyone's done. If we're still typing, I wanna make sure everyone has a chance. Okay, almost ready? Yeah, all right, Professor Wint. Okay, um, where are we on time? Shall we do some editing or do we think that the... Let's read it through once and see what we let's, think. Let's read it through once, okay. All right, should, how should we read it? Should we um, ask folks who've written to read what they wrote? Or no, someone said no. Okay, no. Uh, Professor Wynn, do you wanna read? Why don't you and I read it? How about I can, that? Yeah, okay. how about, how about All right, we we'll read? We'll take I, turns. I'll I, start, I, go ahead. Can we go right to I the I see it's still generating. Is everyone done? Because as people type in, it will change. So I just wanna make ah, okay. sure. All right, so we'll just make sure that we give everyone a chance to finish. Anyone need a little more time? It's okay, we're not gonna rush you. This is a creative process. What do you think? I think we can go. We can okay. do line by line yep. by line. All right. Um, okay. Ready? Yeah. Diaspora, a story and community. Would we have been friends? Would time be our favor? Would it be willing to bend? Stripped down to core, lay my wounds bare. Huayang, Huanian, Hayati across a wall. Song of my many mother's echoes in the earth. I hear it and I scream for those who can't. Home howls like hope, like family leaning together across the gray snow. We spiders weaving maps of years past try to translate your life into mine, but I mourn the lost threads between us, stretched, snapped, and stomped on. Fed by the a food as warm and comforting as my mother's embrace when I last left home. When travels come to rest, we speak without saying words. TV chattering, pop open the lid, not spill, don't push, Miss Katish. Home is like the wall ivy climbs, growing and changing course with stone. The tenderness connects us from one motherland to the other. Define river. Define difference. Define indefinite identity ever flowing. Mother tongue like an oil spill, slick spit swans, ducks beneath. 
My trees, where are they? No, orchard, aspens, redwood, palms, groves in my heart. Be unapologetically ambitious, dream big, be the person who builds a world where opportunities no longer run away. Much like the brimming of tears and a familial hug, lids warm and shudder, hearts flutter with each mutter, much like my mother. The words that wash over my ears like a sweet breeze, I fail to breathe them to others and myself. Vein to vein, my blood boils at the temperature of your words. We both choke. Well done. I think we all deserve to applaud yourselves. Well done. So feedback, anybody want to respond to what you've written and created collectively? Um, well, I know it was just happenstance, but I really like the, what lines happened to be first and last. The opening with the questions was felt like a really nice way to open. And then the last line of we both choke was like, I don't know, like had this sort of perfect finality to it. Mm -hmm. I like that even though there were like several different authors, it sounds as if it's one person speaking. Like it's sort of even though there were several different authors, it felt like one person was speaking like as a collective. Beauty of community, right? Yep. Someone else? Um, yeah, I like the continuity of it, like you were saying, and um, I like the inclusion of the other languages. And I think it's just really interesting that it sort of shows the varying relationships that people have with family at home, yet it still sounds cohesive. Mm -hmm. Someone else? I felt that hair on my arm stand up at one point. Did anyone else have a similar, yeah, do you wanna? Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I also like kind of got goosebumps at a few points. Um, I felt like it did, like the previous person said, I feel like it did a really good job of kind of explaining how, or like showing how like home can have both positive and negative connotations like in one, like they're, they're it's kind of like this complicated relationship. Someone else? No? Anyone else? Are there things, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think similarly to how Professor Wint defined motherhood in so many different ways, I think this poem shows a bunch of different conceptions of motherhood, which is beautiful. Thanks, Kyla. Someone else? Okay. All right, Professor Wint. I was just going to ask people if there are lines in here that you did not write that feel like something that you could have written or that's, um, that really stand out to you. And if that is the case, if anyone could maybe read or pull out one or two of those lines, not a line that you wrote in your own group. It's too tiny for me to read, but there was something full from the abstract, that whole stretch uh, of lines. This one here, fed by the real, full from the abstract, a food as warm and comforting as my mother's embrace when I last left home. Are you able to make that text a little larger? Would that be possible? Oh, there Does we go. Does that work? Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's nice. Nice to meet you. Um, the one that I that really stopped me was we spiders weaving maps of years past try to translate your life into mine. 
but I mourn the lost threads between us, stretched, snapped, and stomped on. That's the one that made my hair stand up. And it did it again. <laughs> it's complicated, right? Relationship between mm. mothers, origins, and us. The where we came from and what's still with us. And the other question that I have for you all as we are maybe running close to the end of time, is as we think about origins, all of us in the room and not are coming from very different kinds of um, very different origins, very different experiences. Yet I threw you into groups of three and said, write a collective two or three lines about home, while home and origin may mean something very different for all of you. So what did that experience feel like? How, how did you navigate that in your small group of three? Anyone want to share? I know some of you sat with friends, so maybe it wasn't that odd, but some of you ended up alongside strangers, right? Or folks you don't know so well. Anyone want to talk about that? Um, with me, I think it was very much just this thing of like trying to make sure all of our conceptions of home were realized. Like we all like each wrote our own lines and like then tried to combine them towards the end to have a result. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you all get to hear that well? Yeah, they each wrote their own line and then brought them together. That's one process. Yes. Thank you. Um, my partner and I, it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> we had heard about each other from other friends and we ended up meeting here. And we also realized we have very similar family backgrounds. We both have families from the Middle East and I'm from Pakistan, they're from Iran. So it was incredible that we ended up sitting together and making such a connection. And we decided to get tea together in the Middle Eastern fashion. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm glad we're building community outside of the exercise. Someone else? There's something also so intimate about the, this idea of home and a, a connection to one's mother and a connection to one's own language. Um, so this question is also about how you navigate that, that particular intimacy in a large room, in a large space to share with others. So I have a question for you. What do you think, or, and I don't have an answer, this is an honest question. What do you see as the connections, if any, between this exercise, what you wrote, and the story of Cromwell Day? Anyone? Um, I think if anything, it kind of ties together the significance of commemoration. So on one hand, commemoration can be a framework of like remembering those who are significant to us but are no longer here, but also it reminds us that we should commemorate the people still with us and how they influence us in everything we do. So I think that's kind of what we like engaged in with this practice. commemoration. Um, it made me think about like the importance of acknowledging um, how everyone has different experiences um, and just like different personal histories based mm -hmm. on their race, class, gender, and just the intersectionality of all of that. Absolutely. Someone else? Okay, Professor Wint, closing words, and then I'll take it from there. Um, 
I really just want to say thank you to everyone for engaging and being so open. Um, I've, I said, I've asking, asking you to write about home and your mothers and mourning and sorrow and love and community are all, um, those are very intimate things. And, and to ask for that kind of interiority in uh, nearing the end of a day when I know you're also doing um, a lot of other kinds of engagement and in a room of people that you know and love and others that you maybe don't know at all is a lot. And so I am really grateful for you to you for honoring um, the space and honoring the exercise and sharing. And we came up with this beautiful collective work. So thank you all. Thank you, Professor Wint. And I'm gonna close by reading just a little bit from my editor's introduction to this issue that features Daughter Song Diaspora. Editor's introduction. As it stands, death shapes the horizon of life. Susanna Siegel. Yet absence is a form of presence and an active shaping of the now, in memory, in mourning, and in melancholia. Presence is similarly an absence from elsewhere or elsewhen, Wambui Mwangi. When the guest editors of this special issue approached me with their proposal in the summer of 2020, the world was just a few months into the COVID-19 pandemic but we had already lost over 100,000 people in the United States and nearly half a million people globally. Our family, social, school, and work lives were upended as we moved in and out of shutdowns of the institutions and spaces we had lived our lives in as we had known them in order to contain the virus's spread. We were also in the throes of the national and global reckoning over anti-Black violence and police brutality that George Floyd's murder by Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin inspired. Moreover, four years of autocracy, of autocratic presidency, have wreaked havoc on our legislative, judicial, and executive branches, peopling them with actors bent on undermining, if not destroying, these cornerstones of US democratic governance from the inside. Those malignant forces also overtly empowered the conservative and regressive sectors of the general population who feel aggrieved by the hard-won victories of social justice movements against racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, misogyny, etc., going so far as to rally themselves to insurrection and sedition. At the same time, we could no longer ignore an increasingly urgent global climate change crisis made manifest in raging wildfires, destructive hurricanes, unprecedented flooding, deadly snowstorms and freezing temperatures, devastating earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and droughts. In sum, since we were grieving so many losses, past, present, and future, a Meridian special issue on mourning made obvious sense. However, I hadn't thought about how mourning could be feminist until I read guest editors Kimberly Juanita Brown and Jyoti Puri's proposal. To them, feminist mourning moves beyond individual and or collective grief over what has been lost to contend with the social and political conditions that exacerbate death and dying. In other words, feminist mourning politicizes and historicizes the disproportionately high impact and negative experience of loss of life has on those of us who belong to vulnerable communities, identities, and social statuses. Thus, we not only grieve the 1 million COVID-19 deaths recorded in the United States and the 5.8 million deaths worldwide as of this writing, but as a feminist of color, I mourn the injustice inherent in the fact that poor people, black indigenous people of color and women have borne the brunt of COVID related illness, disability, death and dying. Feminist mourning calls us to move through and beyond personal grief's veil of tears and sorrowful lamentation to collective commemoration and creation of possible futures. Thank you for joining us in that collective project. All right, so thank you for coming to the workshop. Meridians is literally right behind Sessions House next to Helen Hills Chapel. You have five classmates here who work with Meridians. I invite you to read us. We're available on Project Muse and to cite us in your classwork. Share us with your friends, submit your work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wendt. And thank you thank to you. your little girl. <laughs>
If you didn't sign in um, on the sign-in sheet, please do so, so that we can add you to our Meridian's newsletter, which will be going out soon, and you can stay up to date on everything we're doing. <laughs>